Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good to be here. Good to uh, be back in presenting uh, to the building designers again. So um, today, talking about the digital swindle. So how much data do you have and is it relevant? Um, some context for this. So I'm going to be playing a little bit of the devil's advocate today because I come from a world of digital. Um, I've uh, lived a life of BIM and virtual information for a long time. Um, but it's led me to some interesting realizations about data in general. And um, that's kind of, it's going to be very impactful on our industry in the coming years. Um, and I'm, even to what's been kind of said today, we're seeing a lot of talk about digital information um, requirements, essentially how we start dealing with information. And it's becoming a bit of a, a, a monolith in terms of how we deal with it. So I'll be playing a little bit of a devil's advocate. Um, for some context, this is where I started. I started on an AO drawing board all the way back when um, doing uh, perspective drawings. These are a couple of mine from many years ago. So um, this is how I started. This is technology for me when I first started, the kind of spinning the wheels and so forth, thinking about multiple kind of vantage points, viewpoints, getting it all right, doing hand rendering, um, really thinking about the beauty of an image uh, and how you produce it and, you know, uh, the millions of little lines in order to get there. So this is kind of, I guess, the context of where I started. Um, my first job was actually with an, ar an architect doing drafting, and I did this uh, type of hand rendering for him. Um, I guess it's uh, indicative of my career, but I suggested to him all the way back then that we start using AutoCAD and uh, or MicroStation, um, which he agreed to. And we started doing a kind of combination of half digital kind of printout, just line work, um, and then hand rendered on top. Some really beautiful work. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any of those anymore. Um, all the way up until modern day, which is my business um, in any uh, the one that I founded about eight or uh, 10 years ago now. So in this uh, business, we do um, virtual, uh, virtual environments, essentially. So um, live interactive 3D information. Um, hopefully we can see some of these videos. They don't seem to be playing. There we go. Um, essentially interactive 3D walkthroughs. Um, we all know them pretty well. Um, we've seen some pretty good ones with things like uh, Revit and so forth. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum is kind of smart cities and building data. So essentially how you control buildings, um, the live information feeding into them, the building information model behind the whole thing, um, how it integrates from uh, life cycle, from the design process through operations into maintenance and potentially um, decommissioning the building at a later stage. So I've kind of had a very broad range across uh, 20, more than 20 year career. Um, in the built environment. Um, you know, this is kind of the work that we do. And we work mainly engagement. That's where I started with my business, um, thinking about how we engage people in architecture, show the representation, do the renderings, essentially. I'm um, saying thing you did hand drawing 20 or 30 years ago, but um, just a little bit prettier and quicker. Um, well, not prettier, I know that's, um, that's subjective. Um, um, through to operations, and we've kind of worked in every, any, every sector, um, mining, uh, hospitals, uh, schools, residential, mixed-use development, uh, transport, um, kind of across the airports, um, kind of everything we've kind of worked on. And, and where we've kind of finished now, or where we, we are now, um, is uh, military. So we're working with the Defence Force doing um, data digital twins of the natural environment. So taking a whole bunch of information and generating real environments, but from data. And so you can start linking these things together. And this is where we're getting in terms of city controls, kind of automated systems, internet of things, or that whole kind of data world. And it is this idea of the digital twin, which is popping its um, head up more and more. Um, essentially automated building, digital twin, call it once you want, a digital representation, representation linked to the real world in such a way that we can control it. Um, lots of views of them, but we can generally all agree that the vision is to create assist efficiencies across the entire life cycle from design through to de decommissioning and living and so forth. So not a new idea. Um, this is kind of one of my first uh, views of it. So going all the way back to Mission Impossible, 1996. And here's Tom Cruise looking at um, a smart building, an automated system. You can see it's, it's actually not too different than what we have now. There's a 3D model of it. Oh, this is actually a lot better than what we have now in a lot of cases. Um, and you can see we're looking into a floor and you might recognize this building. It's um, fairly recognizable if you live in Sydney. And look at that. I love that. That's actually just one of my favorite. I'll run back to that because you can see 3D representation to real model. 
you can see it, it's not exactly right, but close enough, close enough for representation. But what's really good is back in 1996, we had an idea that these things could be so tightly controlled that you could open the vent system just in time for Tom Cruise to fall through and uh, do his operation. Mission impossible, well, impossible. Um, if you know anything about these systems, you wouldn't really want to try that. But hey, that's all right. Um, for those that would like to know, that's Arthur Philip Power, um, 1996, uh, that film was made. So interesting. Um, but that's kind of where I started with smart buildings. And the reality of where we've kind of got to with smart buildings is images like this. Um, you know, digital, digital architecture, it's all defined as a set of images and flow graphs and things. And, and it's not actually very relatable, relatable to me anyway. Um, and this is the data strategy that we're essentially being enacted across the, seeing enacted across the world. And I often just ask, where are the beautiful buildings? Because I see more and more data and I see less and less really beautiful buildings. And it's, it's like, this is another really subjective thing. And I often ask it is, do we build be buildings better now for all the digital information and tools that we have? Or did we build them better back in the 1930s? Because what I find is I wouldn't try to do parkour on uh, one of our modern buildings. You know, the, the value engineering doesn't really allow for it. You need old good structures for that type of solidity. Um, having said that, we build them faster. Um, less materials, more sustainable, it's a whole range of things that we do better. But are the buildings actually better overall? It's an interesting question. And for me, I'm, I, I kind of, I think not, to tell you the truth. So, and what I see instead of really beautiful buildings is data, um, a lot of it. And if we're thinking about data, let's think about storage because we're actually out of storage space. And this is a kind of something that not a lot of people really know. Um, it's our industry and we build a lot of things. And one of the things we build a lot of is data centers. And there's thousands of these things. So I think Microsoft already has about 200 huge data, data centers. And I know of um, them building another 40, uh, well, almost completing about another 40 in the next few months. Um, but they've also stated publicly that they expect to build 50 to 100 a year um, in order to kind of just maintain their data needs in the coming, or well, they don't really say how many years, but I suspect it's not very many years because the scary thing about um, the, the 200, about the 200 data centers being built around the world currently, and that would be kind of Google, Microsoft, Amazon, all your biggest companies in the world is that they're not even built yet. And 80% of the storage space is already, already allocated. So we're really running out of space. And another part of this is the fact that think about how much heat your hard drive generates, just your little laptop. Think about the heat of a data center. In fact, ask a data center builder about the cooling system and how much heat the cooling system generates. It's a bit of a herd of elephants in the, elephants in the room. We don't really talk about it because we talk about environmentalism, but at the other end of it is, a, is a, quite a scary data storage problem. So what I'm finding is our data is actually boiling the world. Now, this is, a really, this is our industry, so we have to kind of think about these things. So, I'll ask some questions about data um, and just kind of thinking about operations and living and so forth and data. I'll ask a question. I do ask this fairly often in my um, presentation. So what is the most asked question in any building in the world? I'll give you a second to kind of ponder this. You know, people say, hmm, what could that be? And, you know, like, uh, how do I get there? Maybe or something. And in fact, it's always, where is the bathroom, please? Every single time, every building will I guarantee you site offices, like temporary structures, permanent structures, because someone's always there going, oh, I need to go to the toilet. Um, and so, it's, and when we think about that, that's actually thousands and thousands of hours of committed time across probably every day, just to that one simple question. So if we're thinking about smart building and your smart building isn't answering that one simple question, you've already lost a huge amount of efficiency and in, in information. So everyone's looking to data and I find Big data is kind of a thing now. It's like we do analytics, AI, and so forth. But can data really solve our, our industry's issues? Because what I seem to be seeing is that data is actually part of the problem, maybe one of the biggest problems. So qu some questions about data. How much time do we spend on email every day? Um, I ask this to a lot of people, bosses a lot less, uh, but 
Um, generally, on average, if you take it across all industries across the world, it's about 30% of our collective time is spent on emails. And I often ask also, do emails actually solve a problem or answer a question? They very rarely do. In fact, this email usually produces another email and then a third email and then you CC someone in. And before and long, you have a whole email thread. And then if someone wants to catch up to where you're up to, you have to read the email thread. So we actually spend a huge amount of time just kind of just looking at emails. How many emails does it take to resolve an issue on average? So any issue. So, hey, where's the bathroom? Ah, oh, we'll go find it. Yeah. What happens is about 18 emails for any single issue that we have in the world. And that's a lot of effort for just, I don't know, what could probably be solved just by having a chat. So do you trust data? And this kind of leads us to this idea of data because we're seeing a lot of it around all the time. And I often ask, do I really trust data? And I think sometimes, you know, maybe sometimes I do with context. Yeah, so if I know, if I've gone to site and I've seen where it is and I could go, oh, yeah, that measurement is that, I start trusting the data. Um, but ultimately, I actually don't trust data. I always have to check it. I've got to check it twice. And we don't tr trust data for a good reason. And we don't trust data because, well, it's not really trustworthy. So I've got a million of these videos, but here's a couple of, uh, just I've kind of got. So this one is uh, an automated Uber driver in somewhere, Chicago, New York, somewhere. Um, and as, anyway, as you can see, car stops, red light. Oh, there he goes. We don't trust data because it doesn't really work. It makes mistakes. It, it doesn't have empathy that humans have. And that becomes an issue. And, you know, same with, you know, when we look at, oh, oops, is this one going to come up? Here we go. Um, so this is another one. This is, oh, let's bring this into the screen so we can see it better. There's a Boston Dynamics robot. Oh, get stage travel. That's an expensive robot. Ouch. So, Data is actually, it has some issues around it. And, and when I've thought about data, and this is something that I've kind of realized in the last few years, is this idea of a data axiom. And we have to kind of think about what is the core meaning of all of this data that we're using. And what I've found is data begets data. Those emails, for instance, one email begets another email, begets another email. And if you boil that down, it actually comes down to a really simple data axiom. Every piece of data takes a minimum of two actions to have meaning. So collection and barrication, for instance. If I want another person to see my data, I've got to store it. And then they've got to go collect it and verify it, which is up to five actions. So you see how data actually becomes a thing that needs more data to justify the data itself. And we never actually answer the question. So, and this is something I've been asking a lot of large organizations recently, is how much data do you actually have? And most people can't tell me. There's a few that can. Um, one very large, oops, I'll come back. One very large organization uh, put put their um, their data at about uh, what was it? Um, one picabyte, and that's storage. So they've done a big data operation over the last since COVID started to kind of you know get a, map, a handle of all their data. And they've got about a picabyte themselves. It takes about forty about forty million doc documents they say to deliver an average mixed use development. Wow. That's a lot of documents and a lot of data. And then it's trolled. So I guarantee most people never, no human eye will ever look at all that again. But an AI will troll it. And every time an AI, AI trolls it, it creates, creates another set of data and another set of data that will troll. And so we're actually producing this back to this idea, data begets data. It's a, it's a never ending cycle. So how much organization does your have? Go figure it out. It's an interesting thing. I personally have about eight terabytes of information. Um, scattered across various hard drives, some in the cloud. I've got about four terabytes on the cloud, I think. And I access probably a few gigabytes of it. In fact, if I really think about it, a, a few megabytes regularly, like some big files here and there, but you know, this uploading, kind of transferring, that generally, I don't really ever look at the data. It just sits there and stores and well, boils the world. So we've all kind of, kind of achieved this idea of the paperless office. In the, last, um, in the last kind of decade or so, we've kind of gone there. Most of us can actually do that image pretty well. That's how I worked um, for the pretty much the last decade. Um, and the reality is the paperless office is no longer the most sustainable approach. And I kind of came to this, I think about 15 years ago, we inflected. So it used to be save a piece of paper because a piece of paper represented embodied energy from a forest and you had to process it and so forth, transport 
all that type of stuff. But now think about one email. An email you wrote 15 years ago is still sitting on a server somewhere, probably multiple times. It's probably been duplicated, backups for storage and so forth. And that email now might have been over the next 10, 15 years as big data and analytics and AI start trolling. It might be touched a thousand times. Every time it's touched, it produces a tiny bit of energy. So when, at what point is paper more, less sustainable or more sustainable than the digital email? It's, a, it's an interesting concept because what I'm finding is that maybe I just need to delete my, all my data to actually be really sustainable. Oh, that's great. But then what's important? And so it actually leads us to what, you know, mind blown for me. Anyway, it's kind of, as I've realized these things, like, holy shit, is my data important? Excuse my language. And, you know, this leaves, it's a bit bleak what I'm kind of talking about, but there are solutions and it leads us to a bit of a, a, an interesting thing back into design, funnily enough. So, Integrating a virtual life cycle model. So thinking about the BIM, the information, but a minimalist version and thinking about it throughout the entire life cycle from the initial engagement of your client, the kind of hand sketch, all the way up to decommissioning. And you kind of have to think of the virtual model as a single entity throughout that whole process. It's, it's as much as a building, it's as much as part of the building as a brick. And this is what I've kind of been saying to some people, when a builder finishes, do they go to the brick and take, go to the building and take a brick as a souvenir? They don't, they leave it there. And it's very similar to digital, digital information. Now. Digital information has become almost as real as a brick. So if we expect to take our digital information away from the building and make money from it, well, there could be an ethical problem there because the building itself, the digital model attached to that building is in an in a sense, inherently that building. It's in fact, we're starting to see this idea of insurance and linked to the digital model and how we're maintaining the building. And so it becomes a question, what is the digital model in terms of, in, in terms of sustainability and, um, and how long will it survive? Probably forever, probably longer than the building itself. Another really interesting concept. So we can realign our, our digital content budget to create a human interact, uh, to create, um, uh, sorry, a human interaction, value-driven digital asset. And human interaction is really the key here. So digital information, if it's sitting on a hard drive, not getting used, is costing us money and time. And it becomes a risk. So really, it's about what is being touched, what is being looked at by a human. And that's where our digital information, and so it's the 3D model and so forth, can actually start letting us know these things. And an engagement quality model is developed incrementally in parallel to the building process. So I used to be created digitally first and then build it. I'm actually not very much anymore. I'm kind of create them in tandem. Like solving a issue on site is almost always the most cost-effective and quickest way to do things, especially at the end of, let's say, three months of problem. You get to site, you get all the people and you solve it. And in fact, that's how digital information can be used really well, is we don't store it for other people to look at, but we use it in real time as we're solving problems on site. It's actually, it kind of starts thinking about it. And when you think about it this way, you start having this data-less approach. So you can remove data and effort in a data-less approach from communication. So all the information we do is all about communication, but does it solve the problem? Something else to ask yourself in terms of your design and business processes. So using visual engagement and an alignment. So we can essentially use visual information more than documentation. It's a strange concept and engage all non-technical stakeholders over time. That's everyone. You want everyone in the building to somehow touch the data that you made. Otherwise it becomes not valuable enough to keep. That's essentially the reality that I've realized. The discussion, how do we create a more sustainable digital approach throughout the building life cycle with data-less processes by removing documentation and effort and re-diverting budget to life cycle budget saving design outcomes and realized into operations? Because that's what we're looking at here. We actually have to have our design benefit operations 20 years later. And how do we generate value from soft operations, increasing awareness of the two-way impact of human and the built environment? And soft operations is things like, where is the toilet? It's not, does that HVAC work? Because that's, you know, we can tell it's broken. Um, the reality is you have a thousand people in coming into a building every day asking for a toilet. So I'll leave you for this, with this one thought, thought as a designer. Are you selling data or design? The digital swindle. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. So we've um, 
got a, f- a few people out there that are obviously agreeing with all of this technology um, and, the, and the pride in workmanship and so forth. So it's really, really good. Um, now, when people talk about the emails and so forth, um, you know, there's a question that someone just texted me uh, a minute ago. You know, what, what do you see the future if, if we've got all these email <laughs> issues with emails? What is the solution? What is the solution to this? Uh, look, it's when you think about this, and it's a, it's a strange thing. So when I talk to these large organizations um, about their data and their information, a lot of it is actually just the email storage. So if you, do you need it? And it becomes a thing. How much effort would it take to go back and relook at all the emails to decide if we need them? Um, and it's kind of like when your house burns down, you know, you lose everything, but it's not the end of the world. So what I've come to, and, and this is going to become a cost analysis problem, essentially, does the storage of your emails and information over time cost you more environmentally in terms of keeping that information on the server than just deleting it and not ever having those costs in the next 10 years? So the simple thing is maybe go back, flag the important ones, look for some keywords and delete everything else, 95% of information. Once companies and the large guys, I think are starting to think this way. Once they see this, they're going to start saying that they can save a few million dollars just by deleting data. And who has the most data in the world? Google. They could actually stop boiling the world just by deleting more than half their information. 